If you have your Bibles, take them out with me. Open them up to Acts, Acts chapter 2. Uh, for those that were here last Sunday, I uh, began a, a new teaching series that I've entitled uh, Responding to Jesus. And last week, we, we looked into the abundant life that we can have in Jesus. Uh, J- Jesus didn't say that he came that we might have life and stopped it there. He said that he came that we might have life and that we might have it to the full or that we might have it more abundantly. And, and, and God has purpose that each one of us would live in that abundant life. So if you missed that, you can go back to our website. All of our, our, our past messages are there. Today, I've entitled this morning's message, Where the Spirit of the Lord is. Where the Spirit of the Lord is. And and we're going to read a a portion of this here in just a moment. But Acts 2 records an an awesome historic event that I would say changed the church forever. We recognize this as the coming of the Holy Spirit into the life of the church on the day of Pentecost, often referred to as the baptism or the infilling of of the Holy Spirits. It happened just as definitely as Jesus' birth, just as definitely as Jesus' resurrection, and the believers all identified that they were never the same, that their life was forever changed. Many would say the church really became the church there on the day of Pentecost. And what I would say in Don't throw me out when I make the next statement. Hear me out. We don't need Pentecost again as such as it was back then, just as we don't need the the birth, life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's still there. It's still working. It's it's still available in each one of our lives. Here's what I would say, because it's still there, it's still available. We constantly need the infilling of the person of the Holy Spirit into our lives who should be controlling our lives and we would say also in control of the life of the church. I I, I was blessed many years ago uh, to have a, a similar experience, not exact, but a similar experience is this, where, where I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. We would say with the evidence of speaking in tongues, but what I say is I, I don't live off just that experience. I, I need the infilling of the Holy Spirit every day into my life. Every day, I need more of the Holy Spirit. So I, what do I do? You've heard me say this. I wake up and I, I surrender to the work of God. Part of the work of God is the infilling of his Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that work of the Holy Spirit in each one of our lives. So Acts 2 is just a fascinating chapter of Scripture. An unbelievable passage in the Bible. And it has much to teach us as a church if we're really going to know the spirit of Pentecost. I would say where the spirit of the Lord is, there is something spiritually special happening. Something spiritually special that's happening in your life, prayerfully my life, prayerfully in the life of of the body of Christ. And so let's, let's read this together. Acts chapter 2. Pick up with me in verse 1. It reads, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the, the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans. 
then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Father, we say thank you for your word this morning. God, over the next few moments, help us to to dig in. God, and to capture your revelation, your truth. God, and I pray that our hearts would be receptive. God, to that which I believe that you have appointed for each one of us. God, and that, that we respond well. Lord, to your word today, believing that your will would be done. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Can I say this before I get into all of this? This happened a couple thousand years ago, but it's still happening today. It it was a a word and a message for approximately 2,000 years ago, but I yet still believe it's a word for the church today. We, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And, and I would submit to you today, I believe that there are at least, at minimum, four results that happen where the Spirit of the Lord is. And I want to identify those four for us over the next few moments. No, number one, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the presence of the Lord. There is the presence of the Lord. Reflect back with me, Acts chapter 2. There there was a sudden and a strange awareness of a supernatural happening. A sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind filled the the whole house, the Bible says, where the, the follower of Christ were waiting. And then tongues of fire came to rest on each of them. And then the Bible says, not, not just that a few of them, or not just that some of them, but the Bible says, then all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, or we would say languages, that they had not previously learned. That's supernatural. You know, they, they didn't have Babel like we have Babel today, or was that a stone where you can go out and you can learn this language and then make it look like you've learned it? No. That, that, that didn't exist back then. This was a supernatural occurrence of the outpouring, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And I said it earlier, I believe it's still happening today. People are still being filled with the Holy Spirit. Just, just as well as it was a gift from God some 2,000 years ago, I, I still believe that it's a gift of God that's available for every believer, not, not, not just a select few, not just some, but, but it, it's a gifting that, that is literally available for yet every believer today. The Bible says that the crowd heard them speaking and banded together in amazement. A very special moment in God's eternal plan was taking place right before their lives. Once again, we we identify this as the outpouring or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I I, I would identify it this way. The Holy Spirit, the very presence of God, was entering into a new temple. A new temple. You know, if you go back to the Old Testament, there was a a couple unique occurrences of the presence of God literally filling a temple. The first of these we find in Exodus 40, verse 34. Scripture identifies, Then then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. It gives us the idea that that something was missing. Something was absent from the temple. It had the the tapestries. It had the animal skins. It had the various things. Yet yet there was still something that was missing within the temple. The the temple probably looked uh, 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 amazingly beautiful. Yet there was still something missing. And what was it? The presence of the Lord. The presence of God. Then years go by and that temple is destroyed. And then we read of another temple that was rebuilt, referred to as Solomon's Temple. And it was, they said, magnificent, unbelievably beautiful. Yet once again, something was missing. First Kings chapter 8, just getting to the crux of it, it said, Then the cloud 
filled the house of the Lord. What was the cloud? The presence of God. Once again, filling the temple. Two, two unique occurrences in the Old Testament. And now we jump into the New Testament. And the temple in the New Testament isn't brick and stones. is isn't animal skins and beautiful curtains. You know what the temple in the New Testament is? You and me. We are the temple. Made in the image of God. Beautiful. Yet there was something lacking. And Jesus kept talking about the gift, the gift, the gift you need. What was that gift? The Holy Spirit who representative is the presence of God. The infilling of the presence of God, the, 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 the very literal presence of God. Corinthians identifies that, that you and I, we now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he, he desires to reside, to dwell, to, to literally to dwell within each one of us. Christ is the foundation. And every born-again believer, we are now those living stones. We are now the living temple. And God desires to reside, to literally to reside, to take up residence in each one of our lives. So where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's a manifestation of His power and an awareness of His holiness in relation to sin. We see this through the blowing of the mighty wind and the tongues of fire. We, we, we've never seen it before happen just like it happened on the day of Pentecost, but once again, I'll declare it's still happening today. There's still the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. Why? Because God's yet still moving. God's yet still blowing across this world. What was that tongues of fire? It's the representation of the holiness of God, purifying hearts and lives. You see, God's not going to dwell within us if we're living in sin. He wants to purify us. That's what fire is used for, is that purification, that, that cleansing. That, that's the representation that we capture there on the, on the day of, of Pentecost. It's, it's personal. It's personal to those who sense that something is happening in their life, something wonderful, something supernatural is happening in their life, yet it's perplexing to many who don't know the Lord, never, who have no, or, or we would say who have never had the infilling of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Most people who have never had it would say, that's crazy. As a matter of fact, they would go as far as to say that, that that's foolishness, right? What, what did they identify to those in the day of Pentecost? They, they supposed that they were drunk on wine. It's foolishness. It's crazy. But the Bible also identifies that the things of God are foolishness to the world. They are crazy to the world, but to those who have experienced it, it's no longer foolishness crazy. It's, it's now real. It's real. It's supernatural. And I'll say it again. Th th this gifting is for every single one of us. So we realize, number one, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there also is the presence of the Lord. Number two, for you, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is power for evangelism. I believe the day of Pentecost reveals that the Holy Spirit uses or blesses two primary methods of evangel evangelism. Two, two methods of evangelism. Num number one is simply personal witnessing. Go, go back to Acts. Turn, turn your Bible back one page. I, I, I haven't said this in, in several months. Forgive me for not saying this. I, I, I'm going to say it again today. Uh, if you got your Bible, raise it up this morning. Let me see your Bible. Here at, here at Cornerstone, we, we believe in God's word. If you got it on your phone, raise your phone up. If you got it on your iPad, raise your eye. Because I, 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 I realize in today's world, we can have it a lot of different places, right? Can I encourage you? Bring your Bible. We use the Bible here at Cornerstone. I, I, I describe it this way. You, you wouldn't go play basketball without a... Yeah, you wouldn't go try to play football without a... 
You wouldn't go play baseball without a, in a bat. Why would you go to church without your, yeah. Just a little encouragement. Bring, bring, bring your Bible. I got sidetracked this morning. Personal witnessing. Go to Acts chapter 1. We're going to pick up in the middle of this for the sake of time. Verse 8, it reads, but you will receive power When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria. And then it says, to the ends of the earth. If you skip over to Acts chapter 2, verse 4, it reads, All of them, not some, but once again, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now skip down to verse 11, Acts 2, 11. Then verse 11 says, We hear them, catch this, declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues or our own languages. What would I submit to you that they're now doing on the, on the day of Pentecost through the endowment of the Holy Spirit? They're testifying to the greatness of God. They're being a witness to the wonders of God within their lives. Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power to be my witness. Are you still with me this morning, church? The first the first method is that personal witnessing. Now, I, I know what you might be saying. I don't know if I got the gift of evangelism. That's not what I'm talking about today. I understand we may not all have the gift of evangelism, but we are all called to witness. Can I say it again? We, don't, we may not all have the gift of evangelism, but every single one of us are called to witness. Even long before the infilling or the the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a little before that, Jesus gave us the Great Commission. If I just paraphrase this, Jesus tell his, tells his disciples to go into all the world and to preach the good news, making disciples of them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So what, what do we find here is Jesus commissioning, Jesus sending out every single one of us to go and to be a witness. What do we find in Acts 1? What, 1.8 it is the same thing, Jesus promising the gift of the Holy Spirit. What do we find in Acts 2 is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or the power to go and to be that witness that God has purposed for us to be. And then you find in Acts 4.31, just a couple chapters later, after they prayed, this is another moment, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God Boldly. Everybody say boldly. 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 Scripture doesn't say timidly. It says boldly. If I'm not speaking the word of God boldly, maybe I need the gifting of the Holy Spirit in my life. To become, can I say this, more effective in my witnessing. I need the Holy Spirit's. You know, let me, let, me, let me correlate it to you this way. Anybody remember the apostle Peter? Yeah, we, we know him for many different reasons, but one of the reasons we know the apostle Peter is there why Jesus is uh, before the Sanhedrin in that, that crucifixion process. He denies Jesus three times. Now, this is a, a full-grown man, and the first person that he denies Jesus to is a little girl. Why? Because he's timid. He's fearful about his connection to God, to Jesus. And then another comes and they say, aren't you one of those that walked with that guy? And, they, and Peter says no. And then a, a third one comes and, and questions him again. And he denies it again. And then the rooster, the rooster crows. And he realizes, the, remembers the words of Jesus. We like to pick on Peter because we know him, but I'm sure a lot of them had some similar experiences. Anybody want to be honest and say, I've had moments like that? I've been there. Just timid about being a Christian. Can we say it? Almost embarrassed about being a Christian. I've had those feelings. Maybe some of you have had those feelings, but something happens I believe, with the infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. There's a boldness. There's a power. 
that we recognize is present and available for us. You know, it's, it's that, that same Peter, if you go back and look at it in Acts chapter 2, I know I'm skipping around in verse 14, after that experience, that same Peter that denied Jesus three times, they're questioning the followers of Jesus. What in the world is all of this going on? This is craziness. And it's that same Peter in verse 14 that stands up and boldly begins to proclaim what's going on in their life. Declaring God's word, boldly declaring God's word. Now, now there's only one, one, one difference that we recognize in Peter's life between a, a few chapters earlier in the Bible and now this chapter. What, what is that difference? Is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that he wasn't saved. I'm not saying that he wasn't a believer. And I realize that, that everybody, nobody comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. I, I understand all of that. Yet this was something completely different that was happening in the disciples' life. That forever changed their life as well as forever changed the life of the church. Boldly. If I could correlate it this way, any of y'all play sports? I grew up playing sports. Any of y'all play sports? I don't play much today. I just, I, I don't think I physically can. I got too many injuries that have mounted up in my life, too many other problems. Um, but, you know, that, that competitive net nature sometimes rises itself, right? It, you know, you know what I'm talking about, Mike? That happened to me this weekend, actually. I'll be getting in trouble for telling this story, but my wife and I just on the spur of the moment, we decided to go up and visit my parents uh, up at the lake and went to go hang out. And you take back roads to get to my parents' house. It's just one lane going each direction. And we got on the road, and my, my wife, she made this statement. You know, Jerry, it's going to be impossible to pass anybody today. <laughs> instantly, instantly, that competitiveness, at, at that moment, Call it, I didn't feel any need to pass anybody, but something, something hit in. Anybody ever have those moments? Now, I'm not saying that I necessarily did anything illegal. I just, I, I passed those that were going under the speed limits. And I'm not going to tell you how many I, I passed the amount that I needed to pass so that my wife would know that it's not impossible to pass people today. I'll probably get in trouble for this after a while. Y'all pray for me when service is over. I'm going to go somewhere else. You know, so I grew up playing sports. I had this competitive nature. And um, you know, I, couldn't, I couldn't ever imagine playing for a coach um, that would come up, you know, before the game and say, guys, man, here, here's what I want y'all to do. Just, you know, th those guys over there, they're huge. You know, it doesn't look good for us today. You know, we, we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. You know, so just do just just try as hard as you can. And, and, and you know, and whatever happens, happens. I may want to play for a coach like that. A timid coach, shy coach. No, oh, that's crazy. That team doesn't have any chance. You know, I, I, I want to be able to play for a coach, and I had the opportunity to play for a number of coaches that, you know, we're making preparation, practice, and getting ready for the various games. And, you know, we, maybe we're playing the, a better team record-wise. And coach would begin to give us every reason why we should be able to win this game. A, a matter of fact, coach would even come in and, and say, well, I, a matter, I, I know you're better than that team. You know, I, I realize that, that maybe they're 21 and 0, and I realize in your eyes, you, you may look like grasshoppers to them, but can I, can I remind you, there, there's something inside of each one of you guys. There, there's something instilled in each one of you, you guys. I, I want you to realize that there's a power greater in you than that, that's in that other team. There's a power greater than you that's within the world. Doesn't the scripture identify it to us? Greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world, that there's something working within our lives. And and though, and though the enemy is powerful, I believe we are yet more powerful. And though the enemy may be winning some battles, I want you to believe that we are going to win the battle today. Are you with me this morning, church? I want a coach that can make me believe I'm going to win the game. 
I, I mean, I, I was blessed. But y'all, if y'all have seen this church a long time, you know I used to coach soccer. My wife tells me the reason I never was blessed with boys is because how I coached the girls. She goes, I couldn't imagine watching you coach guys. And I did crazy things. I, I did football tactics with girls' soccer that you did with boys' football. Crazy stuff. And, and we, were, we made a transition, one, to a, a better league because they kicked us out of a league because too many girls were getting hurt that were playing us. That's basically what was happening. <laughs> I hate to admit that to you. Um, that's just how I coached. You know, I, I, I coached that if you are running harder and kicking harder than them, then they'll get hurt, you won't get hurt. If you have greater momentum, and you can't do that if you're scared, he who hesitates is going to lose. So you got to fight and go get the thing. You, you, you know, make, make the ref blow the whistle twice before you stop. Don't give up when he blows it the first. I mean, I was one of those horrible coaches. You, you know, and so they, they kicked us out of this league because, I mean, we were just not, it just wasn't pretty. And uh, we went in this new league, and we were getting killed. And um, we kept working with them, doing the best that we can, and I, I finally got to a point I, I, I was tired of losing. Not even playing, I'm just coaching. I was tired of losing. I don't like to lose. And I, I looked at each one of the girls and just politely asked them, do you think we're going to win today? And then one girl says, I, I don't know. I said, why don't you go stand over there? That's good. Do, do you think we're going to win today? I, I don't know, Coach. You go stand over there. Uh, you think we're going to win today? I think we can win today, Coach. Okay, well, you go stand over there. Went down the line, and, you know, we were playing nine on nine, and I think I had seven girls that told me they thought we could win. Guess how many girls started that day? We started the game two girls down. The parents are looking at me like, this guy is crazy. What in the world is he doing? I mean, he won a game now. He's only playing seven girls. This is crazy stuff. And um, I just coached him as hard as I could coach him. And going through the game, and it's like halftime, and it's zero to zero. We're playing down players. And I looked at the other girls, and I said, do you, do you think we can win? I, th- I think we can, Coach. I said, well, I, I know we can. I mean, we're tied. We're playing with less players. What would imagine if we put more players legally on the field? What would happen? Um, I'm not going to say we won that game. We ended up tying that game. But then from that point on, we began to start winning because there was a belief, a boldness that we would win. You see, as a Christian, you have that boldness through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in your life to go and to live that victorious life. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Don't don't listen to the lies of the world. Believe, believe in the truth of God's word, in the equipment of the Holy Spirit in your life. And, And we have it. We have it, number one, for personal witnessing. Number two, we're talking about methods, methods of evangelism. Number two is powerful preaching. I already referred to Peter in, in, in 2.14. He preached boldly with the help of the Holy Spirit. Such preaching that leads people to repentance. Preaching that is anointed. Preaching that is bold. Preaching that, can I say this, is Christ honoring. I, I want you to know this one in church. The Holy Spirit still honors these methods of evangelism and empowers us to fulfill feel them in the life of the church today, in our, in our personal life, to go out and, and to be that personal witness, and when necessary, to publicly and boldly to proclaim the message of God. Number three for you today, let me hurry it up, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there, there's a, a victory of the harvest, a victory of the harvest. Acts 2.41 says, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Anybody identify, if 3,000 were added to the church, that's pretty significant growth. We're we're talking just one day, one day. Pentecost, just a little history lesson. Pentecost was first referred to as the Feast of Harvest, and it celebrated the summer harvest. It was on that day, as recorded in the book of Acts, that the Holy Spirit harvested 3,000 souls. This number itself was significant because it's the exact amount that was killed when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. Any correlation to this? Once again, I don't believe things happen by accident in God's Word or coincidence. 
It's often been said that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter kills, the spirit gives life. On that day, Moses came down from the mountain. 3,000 were slain. But on the day the church was established on Mount Zion, 3,000 were saved. The power of the Holy Spirit. George Whitefield saw about 30,000 converts early on in his revivals in America. In the 1858, if you like revival history, go back and read about this one. In 1858, at the height of it, they believed that 50,000 people were saved each week. In the 1858 revival, the, to, to me, this is only the, only the empowerment, the working of the Holy Spirit. Through Billy Graham's ministry, it's believed that 3.2 million believers came to Jesus. The harvest of the Holy Spirit is still being seen throughout the world today. There's still people being saved. So where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's... There is the presence of the Lord. There's power for evangelism. There's victory of the harvest. Let me get you lastly. Number four is the pattern for doing God's work. It's there through the Holy Spirit that we find the pattern for doing God's work. The marks of a church, I'm talking about the pattern of doing God's work, the marks of a church that does things God's way are found in Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. Let, let's read this. Last scripture I'm going to bring to your attention. The very end of Acts 2. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had needed. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Catch this, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The pattern. For doing God's work, the marks of a church that's honoring God. There's four things I want you to capture real briefly. Number one, the atmosphere. The atmosphere of the early church. When I talk about the atmosphere, hear me. I'm not talking about the lights, the smoke, the music, all that other stuff that we think creates the atmosphere. That's not the atmosphere. You know what the atmosphere was in the early church? The presence of God. They didn't need all that other stuff. And thousands of people were being saved. I think sometimes you try to create the atmosphere and nobody's getting saved. It's only Jesus. It's only the presence of the Lord. But you know what they had? They had a reverence and a fear of the Lord. A reverence and a fear of the Lord. That gave, that gave the presence of the Lord liberty and freedom. Because they were God honoring. God seeking. God desiring. They didn't care who saw them and didn't see them. They didn't care what people thought about them, didn't think about them. They, they just, they were focused in on God, wanting his presence, giving him liberty, giving him first priority. I mean, if we're going to be the church that God has purposed for us to be, it's going to be about what God is doing and what God wants to do in our lives, what God is wanting to do in the life of the church. Number two, their activities, just briefly. There was teaching, verse 42. There was fellowship. There was breaking of bread. There, there, there was prayer. All of, catch this, all of these activities were activities that were led by the Holy Spirit. All of these activities were activities that the Holy Spirit purposed for the early church. Sometimes we get caught up in saying, I, I, I just want to worship the Lord. I just want to hear another teaching. You know, the Holy Spirit also prompted us to eat together. 
to break bread together. The Holy Spirit also prompted us to, to fellowship together. But catch this. All of this was for the sharing of the good news of Jesus. They, they didn't get together and have a game night just for the sake of having playing games. They got together and had a game night for the sake of sharing and spreading the good news of Jesus. They, they didn't get together and eat just for the sake of filling their stomach. They, they got together and ate for the sake of sharing the good news of Jesus. They taught to do what? To share the good news of Jesus. And then they offered their praise, inspired of the Holy Spirit, just offering thanks and worship and love back to the goodness of Jesus. So they had a right atmosphere. They had right activities. Thirdly, they had right attitudes. They were generous. They shared with everybody. They had a unity of spirits. They had a gladness. The joy of the Spirit was in their life. They had praise, and they received favor into their life. Right, right attitudes. And, and what was the result of all of this? Additions. The Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. I don't know about you, church, but that's what I want to see. I want to see the working of the Holy Spirit. I want to see the power of the Holy Spirit because I want to see people saved. I want to see people's lives transformed. I, I want to see the church grow, not grow for the sake of numbers, but growing because people are being saved and lives are being transformed. I want the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit. How about you this morning? Would you stand to your feet with me this morning, church?